So David, if you don't mind, could you give us just a little rundown on some of the accessories you were using? Um, were you using an external follow focus? What, how did you mm -hmm. how did you rig up the camera for this? Yeah, so we had um, we went through a few different rigs, kind of depending on the shooting scenarios. Uh, so for the most part, we were using a wireless follow focus. We had two different systems. One was the DJI wireless follow focus that we were using in conjunction uh, with the MX gimbal flying on a Matrice 600 drone. So that was for our drone shots. Then when we went to uh, our arm car, which is made by a company called Motocrane, so that's all of our driving sequences with the motorcycle. Uh, is is hanging the camera off of a Ronin 2 gimbal uh, on the motocrane uh, we had on a Porsche SUV that we were able to, to keep up with the motorcycle with. And then on that, we were using the Tilta Nucleus follow focus system. Uh, um, so it's follow focus, zoom, and iris. Uh, that gave us a tremendous amount of control inside the car so that we could actually adjust as we were shooting. Um, and then in terms of uh, mounting, we were using just a traditional 4x5 matte box, by wooden camera, kind of typical filtration, uh, really just, just using indies uh, in the matte box to be able to, to get our exposure down where we needed it. And then everything was surrounding that Atlas Orion uh, set of, of cinema primes. So that was the basic setup. Uh, we were using external power, which was helpful. Uh, we were able to use the USB-C port on the side of the camera to be able to feed power from block batteries or from the, uh, from the gimbals. Uh, so that that made our day really easy. We were able to make it through the day with uh, with minimal power questions or issues. The camera fits so well into the appropriate tools. Uh, we basically were able to build it out just as if we were building out any traditional cinema camera. So having it in a DSLR form factor sometimes can be can be tricky. And so the the Zagudo cage that we had was went a long way towards making sure that we had all the right mounting points. Uh, that everything lined up the way it was supposed to, that the lens is centered properly in the matte box. You know, those little things seem like a small issue until they're not right. Um, and so it was nice to, to be able to just fit this into workflows that we were familiar with, into rigs that we were familiar with, uh, and, and not have to make any changes to the way we work. Uh, the camera just just locked in and, and behaved exactly as, you, as you'd expect. What about the internal battery? We haven't really talked about that. And some of these new cameras now, the internal battery lasts like 30 minutes. It's kind of not really usable. And then you got to have 15 batteries to, to go on location. What about the internal battery? Look, we promise a solid two and a half yeah. minutes of battery life. There you go. I, I can in promise 6K. you two and a half minutes guaranteed. In 6K, in nine hours in 1080. Yeah. Yeah. I will say, you know, that was a concern going into it. And part of it was, you know, these are very early, uh, early versions of the camera. Uh, and as such, you know, having access to a multitude of batteries, you know, Matt did his best to get us as many batteries as we could, including a last minute FedEx that showed up the day before. Thank you, Matt. Um, but we only had, I think, across the two cameras, I think we only had four batteries. Uh, and we never felt the, we never felt like we were going to be in a crunch. Um, so we were getting consistently about an hour and a half to two hours worth of, of record time out of each battery. We tried to be conservative. We tried to make sure that we were powering the camera down between takes and you know trying to be responsible with it. Uh, but at no point did we feel that the internal battery wasn't keeping up with what we needed it to do. Uh, we added the external battery when we could or powering from the gimbal just to make absolute sure that we were kind of in a constant mode of charging the battery as we went um, and, and actually kind of powering the, the camera off of the block battery. So certainly that helped, but at no point did I feel like the internal battery was, was gonna be a hindrance. Um, so it, it, did you ever do like the rotation method? So if you have like two batteries, when one's in there and you're charging another, do you have infinite power? Yeah, we had we had access to two chargers. Um, and so with three batteries and two chargers, we could shoot forever. Okay. So, now, so to answer, you can charge a battery, a, a battery in its entirety before you would wear out the battery that's in the camera. You have a, over two hours of battery life. Now, clearly that depends. If I'm in the Arctic someplace yeah, and right. it's freezing, it's not going to work that way. But in normal operating conditions, you should be able to get a consistent two hours out of the battery. And how long to charge one? Uh, it's about, I think it's about an hour and a half or less. So, okay, so yeah. two batteries, you sort of have infinite power right. in uh, most situations. Well, what's important to note too is that um, you can charge right through the USB port on the side of the camera. It's a USB-C port. So your favorite cell phone charger that you probably use to charge your cell phone, you could just throw that thing on the side of the camera and you could charge the battery internally from that, plus you could power the camera from it too. So it's, it's a very easy camera to find power solutions for. Mm -hmm, naturally. Oh wait, can I use the, the thing that I stick my iPhone on and just get it near there? What do they call that? No, uh, oh, near field charging. A Qi charging Qi charger? Yeah. yeah. No. Oh my God, okay. Well, actually, we, what we do is you put a rodent in and there's a wheel and it just charges the battery yeah, from there the rodent you go. and the wheel. So. Uh, okay, so I wanna ask another question. So when 
when you recorded what we just saw, was that done with an internal recording or was that done with an external recorder? Yeah, so everything we shot was entirely internal to the, the high-speed SD cards inside the camera. So uh, we did have it hooked up to an outboard Atmos recorder, mo mostly for monitoring purposes. Um, we used it for a little bit of onset playback, but everything that is actually in the edit came directly from the internal codec inside the camera. I got a question for you, you Matt. Sure. Um, the type of cards you buy, I know there's like a, a whole array of SD cards. What kind of cards do you need? These cards now look like NASCAR vehicles with all these labels on the outside of them. The only label you need to worry about is the one that has a V and it'll have a number next to it. On the S1H, we recommend V90 cards. That means that they're guaranteed to work at 90 megabytes per second. The camera works at about 400 megabit at the fastest codec. V60 cards about 480 megabit is its maximum write speed. For safety's sake, we recommend a V90 because that's closer to 600 megabit write speed. That gives us enough ceiling to where we won't have any slowdown problems that could cause the camera to, to have to shut down during a recording. And I realize a lot of manufacturers quote ridiculously fast speed ratings that are much faster than what we're saying. You gotta remember that that speed rating is for a burst of data. Like if I'm doing a photograph, a single burst, it'll be able to handle that, but it can't do it over a sustained period of time. That V rating guarantees a m the minimum, the slowest the card will work for your video content. And about what size card do you recommend? How many gigabytes? Well, you know, at 400 megabit, you're about 15 seconds per gig if you do the 400 megabit codec. So, you know, that's gonna come up to you as to what your recording needs are. You know, a 64 gig card is gonna come out to 15 seconds per gig, so you're talking, what, 15 minutes-ish for okay, that? Okay, what about at 6K? What's the oh, biggest... 6K will actually record longer because it's a HEVC codec. It's not it's not a H.264, so it's a more efficient codec. It's only 200 megabits per second codec, so it's actually about 30 seconds per gig. So okay, you actually let's... get more recording yeah. time in 6K. Let's go back to 4K. How high do these cards go? How, what's the maximum amount of gigs you can get? Theoretical limit is two terabytes. They now, make a two terabyte card? No, the, the theoretical limit okay. is two terabytes. So you can find, I think, terabyte cards right now. Really? Yeah, so the current theoretical limit for SDXC, uh, which is what we use, is two terabytes. I'm not guaranteeing the camera will work with a two terabyte card because we've never had one to test in the camera, but right. the theoretical limit is two terabytes. Uh, we, we know we can run at least 512 um, gigabyte cards because we've tested those. I would fully expect one, ter one terabytes okay. to work and two terabytes to work. Okay, so a 512 gigabyte card costs approximately what? I know there's different brands, but people are gonna wanna know what they're getting into here. I've never priced out a 512 gigabyte, so I can't give you that. Okay, 256. But, well, a 64 gig card will cost you around 100 bucks. So 64 gig V90 card, about, about $100. And you say 15 minutes of 4K? Yeah, so if you do a, if you do a 128, it's probably like $199, 200 bucks for a And then you get a half hour 4K. Right, and okay. then I, when you get up to 256, it's another doubling of the price. So mm -hmm. it's like about $400 for 256. 512s get a little iffy, because by the time this, by the time this is actually watched by somebody on YouTube, uh, you know, six months, a year from now, that pricing will have changed. 512s are very expensive right now because they're new cards, but they'll eventually follow that same doubling rule where, you know, 99, 200. All right, David, how did you, did you work this? Did you, did you shoot uh, consecutive cards or did you shoot them as duplicates? Yeah, we, we were handling our shoot pretty much the same way that we would shoot a, a television commercial. Um, so everything was, uh, we shot on 128 gig uh, Panasonic V90 cards, uh, and we basically were cycling cards as we needed. So uh, there is two slots in the camera, and you can configure those slots to be used either to, to copy to two cards simultaneously for an instant backup, um, or you can use a, a progressive record where it'll just automatically roll over from one card to the next. Uh, but since we were shooting this more in a commercial style, we knew we were kind of dealing with short takes, uh, and we had plenty of plenty of crew, plenty of people around to keep an eye on things. We were media managing on set. So it meant that we could pretty much just have a single card loaded and move from one card to the next as we would start getting near the end of, of one card. We would just load a new card. When you're working in an environment where you have a, a DIT on set and you have media management happening as you go, um, I typically like to just shoot on a single card at a time just to save any confusion as to whether or not one card got copied when another card didn't, those sorts of things. Um, but knowing that if I was in an environment where I was, say, doing a live event or something where I needed to have a longer runtime, where I didn't have the luxury of being able to stop between takes and pull a card out 
knowing that I have continuous recording as I go from card A to card B, and then I can pull that first card and, and it'll cycle back. So in theory, you can continue rolling nonstop for as long as your content could require. Um, in this shoot, we didn't need to do that, but knowing we've got the option is, is really nice.